Our nation, our country, our future is built by scientists, by engineers, by innovators, by men and women who see value in learning and in change. The Moses Kotane Institute nurtures future leaders through education in maths and science. Our innovative maths and science program bridges the gap between students and educators, ensuring understanding and efficiency. Become our partner and let's invest in our tomorrow together. The Moses Kotane Institute. sit on your laurels some of the companies i know are small companies it's about re-injecting capital and not buying a bmw too soon a ferrari too soon any country would be happy to have these people as entrepreneurs the most critical ingredient to achieve that vision is skills when you steal public money my comrade you are being counter-revolutionary. Right, so um, up next is uh, the group manager, talent learning and development and resourcing at Acelo Metal South Africa, our sponsor for this particular event. And I've got to say they're doing great work there. Uh, on Saturday, I was in uh, Bloemfontein and I met a remarkable young woman. And I think if you open your programs on the first page on the left, um, you will see... Uh, what the private sector is doing and can do and is making a huge difference. Uh, her story is remarkable. I don't know if she's around. Uh, you might be able to meet her. But um, I was just quite moved, you know, at the story that uh, she was a young girl in the townships and now she's a chemical technician, chemical engineer. And uh, it's thanks to the work that the company that... Uh, um, uh, Terence represents is doing, but 
hear it from him rather. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Terence Harrison, Group Manager, Talent Learning and Development and Resourcing at Metal South Africa. Thank you, Peter. Good morning, ladies and gents. This session was actually supposed to be opened by the chairperson. Unfortunately, you couldn't make it, so you settled with me. Right. Uh, people, I'm, I'm at least glad that there's a number of new faces here uh, as from last year, because you're probably getting quite tired of me standing up here and talking to you. So I'd just like to, to acknowledge all of you here today, because this event is really about yourselves, and it's not about any speakers up here, and it's not about any company. It's really about you and what you are going to be able to do by attending this event, by learning and by sharing at this event, by taking that back to your individual companies and putting that back into our learners of today, because that's really what it's about. It's about skilling the nation. It's about making sure that our future leaders are being developed today. And that's one of the slogans that Arcelor has, is to develop people today. So I really plead, and I'll probably end off again by, by reiterating that, just to say we really need to take hands and make a difference. So what I really want to talk to you about today is about skills development and the 20 years of democracy. What have we done? Where did we come from? Where are we going? What's achievable? So it really is a great pleasure that I can be here and, and actually talk to you in terms of this. It's a topic that's reasonably close to my heart. In fact, it's probably inside my heart, the whole skills development thing. I've been doing this for the last 30 years. So it's really a passion for me to, to motivate young people, to train people. And when I was still lecturing, which was probably one of the better times of my life, because as a manager, you don't really know what you've done when you go home in the afternoon. You know, what did I do today? I can't even think. But as a lecturer, lecturing to young learners, seeing what they do when they come in, or what they know when they come in, and what they know when they leave, you can actually see that you've done something. And the footprints that you leave in the sand, which we, our previous speaker showed us, is typically, you can see you're making a difference in the life of somebody, and that is great. That's really nice. I believe that education is really important to the country. It's really what it makes the country tick. If we look at any growing economy in the world, there's a couple of factors that are common. And one of them is they have really good maths capability. So their mathematics capability at school leaving level and at university level is really, really great. Now that's something we need to improve on as a nation. So what did we do? do when we started coming out and, and into the new democracy. We didn't start off very well. In fact, the Skills Development Act came out and we were speaking about learnerships. There was no more mention of apprenticeships. What happened is a lot of state-owned enterprises stopped training or reduced their training capability. Training centers closed down. A lot of other companies said, oops, uh, apprenticeships have stopped. We may no longer do them. We'll wait for the learnerships to come along. Now, the learnerships wouldn't come along on their own. It's up to us as a company or us as individuals within companies to actually generate those unit standards. And that took give or take five years to come into place. So you can imagine how we declined in the first number of years to the point that apprenticeships almost became extinct. It really died down. It died down a lot. We did not, however, stop our training as ArcelorMittal as a company. At those days, we were still known as ISCO. We continued our training, but even us as a company did cut back on our training. Okay, we reduced our sizes. We were busy going through re-engineering programs to make the company more profitable. As a result, sometimes leaders in a company see training as an expense, something we can do without and it's not something we can do without. It's in the times of trouble. It's in the financial crunch time. That's exactly the right time to train and develop your staff. 
so that when you come out of that crunch time, you've got skilled people. Otherwise, everybody's scrambling for skills. And you know what? We talk about the skills crisis. But there are a lot of skills out there. Okay? It's very much like the song that was written by Pink Floyd a number of years ago. Is there anybody out there? Because they are out there. Our skilled people are out there. We just need to find them. We need to entice them. We need to engage them. We need to bring them in. And we need to retain them. It's critical. But we need to train them first of all. That's very, very important. So, typically then, what did we do? We're a leading integrated steel company. We're the largest on the African continent. We're constantly looking for new recruits. We're constantly looking for specifically engineering skills because we're an engineering company and a large engineering company. So we can't be totally reliant on the market producing. We have to develop our own skills. So we took a conscious decision to say we are going to develop our own skills. We're going to be self-reliant in terms of skills development for our own skills. However, we're not going to be selfish. We're going to go over, over and above our own heads and we'll de develop far in excess of what we need so that we can produce extra skills, get people to have valid qualifications, gain experience and release them to the market, which will be beneficial for the South African economy. So everybody's talking about the shortage and how it impacts on us and how the growth rates of the economy are affected, which is all true. But if we go into a collaborative approach, and that is typically what we did, we said, let's not do it only on our own. Yes, we're a big company, and we can afford to set up our own training centers and get our own staff and train our own people and all of those lovely things. But we're not living on an island. We should collaborate with different companies, different colleagues, governmental institutions, and so on. And that's the approach we did. We, we took a collaborative approach. And it works. And everybody here could take a collaborative approach, and we should all be working together. In fact, there is an organization which is loosely sort of supported by EXA, the Engineering Council of South Africa, called Engineers, which actually tries to do this. They're trying to get to everybody in the country to say, what are you doing, and can we not just pull in the same direction? Because if you look around and you ask people, there's a heck of a lot of stuff being done in the country. But we, you know, it's, it's like we have a cart horse with a whole, or a cart with a whole lot of horses. But the problem is the horses are not on the one side of the cart. They're all over. So what we're doing is we're just pulling the cart around like this. And we're not moving in any specific direction. So Ingenious is somebody you should really support. And they're trying to get that cart horse working and moving into one direction. So what we did is we collaborated and we decided that it's time to, to really try and engage with the Department of Education, which we did. And what we did is we created science centers next to our companies or clo in pr close proximity to our, uh, our companies, which predominantly then is in, in KwaZulu-Natal and in the Western Cape and then in Gauteng. And what we did with the science centers is we didn't just make them your standard science center where people can come and have a look at sort of science experiments. But what we actually did is we went and spoke to the education department and said, can we not remove kids from school and bring them to our science centers and teach them maths and science and English? Because English is a very important language to learn in terms of cognitive skills. Maths and science is a very good language to learn. It's probably the easier language to learn than English, to develop your problem-solving skills, which is critical to engineering. So we got to a point now where we have about 3,000 kids in a month that are in our science centers, and they're actually getting their maths and their science and their English and their computer study curriculum in the science centers. It's not an add-on. They're actually getting their classes there. So it's aligned with their curriculum at schools. And that's really made a massive impression. It's really worked. In fact, in, in the Sedi Beng area, in Gauteng, we've increased the pass rate with 5%, and that doesn't sound like a lot, but we're now the second highest 
in the entire Gauteng in terms of, of, of rates for your maths and science marks. So that's really showing that, that that's working and that's important. We have partnerships with the Department of Science and Technology and a number of others. And it's very important to do that to really gain the momentum. Now, it's not a selfish cause and it's not an elitist school. So it's open to the general education public system. But obviously, when people come out of that at grade 12 level, we would be silly not to capitalize on it and bring them into our pipeline programs. And that's exactly what we do. So what we're doing is we're boosting the maths and science at, at school level. And in case you're not aware, we've taken part as a, as a country a number of times in the global survey for maths and science. And this year we came last once again, which is not very good and is indicating to us that we must look at our maths and science in our school system, so basic education. And I think we bring our kids up to kind of be fearful of, of maths and it's this terrible subjects and it's so, so difficult. But it's actually not. We believe maths is not a learning subject. It is. It's a learning subject just as history is a learning subject. You need to learn, you need to practice. And it's not that difficult. In fact, I presented a paper in Croatia a while ago and they were just coming out of sort of the communistic uh, era at that time and they were allowed to study what they wanted to. And I was speaking to an engineer there and, and he said to me, you know, it's terrible now that we're actually coming out of this communism because before that we were told that we had to study. And now you can study what you want. He says, and nobody wants to study engineering. You know, they all want to study these easy subjects. I said, well, what are those easy subjects? And you know what his answer is? They want to study to become a doctor and a lawyer. Now, that coming from an engineer. But um, I hope there's no doctors or lawyers in this uh, audience. But that's, that's exactly how they, they work. You know, they, they, they are maths freaks. They, I think they speak maths before they speak anything else. They're really, really good at it. And it shows. Right, so I've discussed then that the school kids get bussed in to our science centers and that works well. What we've also done is we've engaged with a, a program from the IEEE, which is the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, and any member that's part of that can take part in this program, and it's called the Teacher In-Service Program. Now, the Teacher In-Service Program is a great program sponsored by the IEEE internationally. And what we do there is it's a bunch of engineers who are, are registered with the IEEE, and we go around and we teach teachers at school to make the link between maths, science, and engineering. Because it's all very well at school level to teach a person how to solve for X. But what do you do with X? And you must see the teachers' faces when you actually teach them and show them the link of what they are teaching kids and engineering. And it's like, wow, is that what you do with this solving for X? So it's to turn that light on. We give them all the apparatus they need, and they take that apparatus and they plow it back into the schools, and we encourage them to teach the same class to their kids. So we, do want, we don't want to teach the kids directly because we can only achieve so many. However, if we teach the teachers, the teachers can teach the multitudes. And we want people to get excited about maths and science and to actually engage with it because it's, it's a great thing. We also committed, and there's a number of companies that were in with us, in the, the Technical Business Skills Partnership, often to referred to as the six-pack. As long as it, we, we're not a 12-pack with a sunken chest, you know, it's a, we're the six-pack. And we tried to actually train over and above our own need a whole bunch of apprentices. In fact, we committed to, to 5,400 additional apprentices about, amongst the six com uh, companies, and we went on to achieve that. We partner with our local colleges. We help and assist with lecturer development, and that's critical. Take an engineer out of your training center, put them into the college, allow them to lecture the college for three months, bring that lecturer into your organization, teach them, show them what's actually happening. In the college industry, the average age of a lecturer is 25 years old. They have zero industry experience. They've gone to college, they've gone through the native courses, got their N6, for instance, and become a lecturer. 
They actually have never seen the things that they're teaching about. So it's critical that we capacitate the lecturers in colleges. Make sure that you can engage with your local universities, wherever they are. Embed yourselves in them to make sure that you can add to the curriculum development. Because things become outdated. I always make the joke that um, certain colleges in the maths class and in the science class is actually teaching history and not maths and not valid things because if your curriculum was last updated in 1950, you're teaching history. All right. So it's important. Get on those advisory committees and make sure that the latest technology is embedded into those uh, traditional you know, technicons or universities of technology and, and traditional universities. Make sure you're also involved in all kinds of curriculum development. I'm sure a number of companies here have been involved in, in developing unit standards in the past and going forward. We've dramatically increased our pipelines. We, we are, across the engineering fraternity, we are, are teaching and making sure that we have uh, people developed. So at any one stage, if you go to university, you're going to find about between 100 and 140 of our bursaries students studying at university, fully sponsored. Because we believe we must identify them at school level, we need to nurture them, and that's what we do in our science centers. From there, we bring them into our pipelines, we provide them a bursary, we send them off to varsity, and they get their degree. And you know what? They get their degree in four years. And you know what the national average is for a, a four-year degree? 6.1 years, seven years? Yeah, exactly. So that, we don't, that doesn't just happen because we choose them right. That happens because you nurture them. You provide them with a cradle-to-a-grave concept. You help them. You coach them. You mentor them. You really assist them, and that's needed. There's no other way of doing it. We all know that the shortage of skills is a worldwide phenomenon. Engineering studies or science-related degrees has dropped 25% globally in the last 10 years. People are not studying scientific qualifications anymore. They are studying other things. Okay? Once again, I always say in 10 or 20 years' time, you'll have a lot of people trying to sell product, but there's no product to sell because there's nobody to design it. Okay? We need to increase that. And we specifically need to get our fairer generation in there, our ladies. And they are up and coming now in the engineering fraternity, but we really need to boost them in terms of that. 39% of global businesses are currently struggling with skills. They do not have the right people. They do not have the right skills. We rely on, on the skills, as I've, I've indicated earlier. We have a large training program. We spend far in excess of what we need to spend on training. And we do it gladly because there's a return on investment. It helps your processes and it helps the nation as a, in general. What we all also do as a result of our global leverage and having a, a very global company with uh, a presence in 60 different countries throughout the world is that we can bring home technology as well. So we can go out there, find the latest technologies and bring it home to South Africa, which we do. In fact, we've done a number of these uh, new innovations with new types of steel and steel pr uh, processes. So we have a prefabricated process called the Arval Steel Construction Technology. And what we do with this is we build lightweight frame houses and, and different buildings. It works out much, much cheaper. It's very quick to erect. And what we've done is we've actually now trained local people to generate their own companies to start using this technology. As a result of this, we've donated two schools to basic education over the last number of years, one in Tata and one in Mamalodi. So there's fully equipped schools using this new technology. We've also done a, a, a building and a clinic that you handed over to the Department of Health in Sebo King. And we've also built a number of houses for very needy people in our immediate facilities. So the science centers in our three geographical areas 
is not only there just to make sure that we get a better entrance and a better prepared individual coming into our pipelines, but it's there to make sure that we introduce science, technology and engineering to our local townships so that people can understand what is out there and what kind of careers are available. We really believe in, in growing from within, the whole pipelining concept. In fact, our, our growing from within strategy backfired on me a while ago. Some of our young graduates decided to take it literally, and now they're all on maternity leave. So uh, we've got some future scope. All right, so our first science centre opened its doors in Sabre King in 2006. And as I say, we've now expanded that into KwaZulu-Natal and into the Western Cape, and we're making good grounds there. We offer bursaries for engineers, for technicians, for apprenticeships, and we don't only stop there, we actually support them after their studies. And that's very, very important for anybody sitting here, that you don't just go and look for a qualified person or go and sponsor them at university and say, okay, you studied four years, you're now an engineer, start working. We have internship programs, which I would suggest you really entrench in your training centers to make sure that once an engineer comes out of university, that they go through a two-year internship, which is a structured development program with coaches and mentors. We do it for 18 months with our technicians. We even do it for a year with our artisans. So once they've qualified as a, through their apprenticeship program, they go into a one-year formalized coaching program, mentoring program, where we ensure that they are ready for the workplace. Because, you know, if you're going to do it for your engineer, why would you not want to do it for your apprentice? Right through a learnership program which we, where we teach our production people how to operate the plant, also national qualifications. And Peter actually mentioned about the, the stories and you can go to our stand and have a look there and we've got a number of posters up there and handouts where we actually show you what we have done with some of our students. They look like pin-up models but um, Photoshop I suppose is a great thing but, but it's really taking them out of a township school, educating them and getting them to that kind of level. It's, it's a great success story and it's something that we can all do and we should be doing. So we really take immense pride in our graduates for that. So partnering is great. It's needed. And I'd just like to say before I end off, and there are a number of people sitting in this audience which I recognize who, who would agree with me here. We educate our, our children, but we need to create jobs for them. We, we're very big on importing products and saying, yeah, but it's cheaper. Granted, it may be so. But we're not doing ourselves a favor. Innovation and entrepreneurship is not something you can actually teach at school and you finish the subject and now you're an entrepreneur. It takes time. It needs experience. But I'm sure if looking around at the age group and sitting in this room, if you sit down and think, there's a heck of a lot of product we can develop in South Africa that we import. So I really, really urge you to think about that. Train our people. Design and develop our own products, even if it's a little bit more expensive or at least the same price. And let's go the proud South African way. Then finally, I'd just like to thank you all for attending this. As the sponsor of the event, I, I'd re I'm, I'm glad that you're here. I'd love you to take hands over the following two days, walk around the stall, see what's available, get each other's pokens, right? Touch, touch each other. Get your information, network after the event, share information with each other, help each other. As far as I'm concerned, when it comes to skills development throughout, right from the lowest, lowest, lowest level to the highest leadership development, there shouldn't be any proprietary trade secrets. We should help each other to build the nation. So with that in mind, thank you very much and enjoy your two days.
on your behalf, I'd like to say thank you very much indeed to uh, Terence Harrison, Group Manager, Talent Learning and Development and uh, Resourcing at Acelo Metal. Uh, thank you so much for the work that you're doing, actually. I mean, I saw it when I spoke to this young lady. I can't tell you how excited she was that she had developed to where she is now. Um, and it's those stories that really touch your heart. So, as you were saying, I think um, it, we have to uh, take the initiative and produce uh, the skilled people that we need. Business needs people, but I don't think we can wait. Uh, we have to work collaboratively uh, to make sure that uh, uh, we build uh, this country through developing our people. You certainly have showed us uh, some of the things uh, through your initiatives, lessons that we've learned uh, about um, finding ways uh, particularly during difficult times, uh, to make sure that uh, uh, these skills and uh, these cap human capital resources are developed, uh, uh, f not just for the companies, but for the industries that we work in and the country as a whole, uh, uh, ultimately. So thank you very much indeed, Arcelo Mittal, and thank you very much, uh, Terence Harrison. At Moses Kotane Institute, we have identified the maritime industry as imperative to the growth and development of South Africa and have therefore designed a unique maritime technology program. This program capacitates youth, women and SMMEs with marine transport, engineering and artisan development skills. With this, we aim to establish a knowledge repository that will build the maritime industry. Become our partner and let's invest in our tomorrow together.